So tonight we're going to continue on the EMS series, uh, building on some of the lectures that we've had with some of the different trauma scenarios. So there's this big national push with all these uh, major disasters and uh, terrorist incidents that we've been having, and they've put out a what they call a Stop the Bleed campaign. There's major funding that's been put out there towards this. Um, Sinai Hospital, I believe our department's doing a little something with this, but it's something that our firehouse is going to kind of take and run with. We partnered up with Sinai Hospital, and we're going to start offering these classes at the end of uh, some of our CPR classes throughout the year. So, game plan tonight, and it's a mixed audience out here. Some of you guys are here because you're in the fire department, some of you guys are here because you're my CPR instructors and we're using this for our renewal, but it's a skill that everybody, one, should have because we're all in this business in one way or another. Um, and after that, we're going to go through and we're going to go kind of head to toe and I'm going to go through, for some of you it's going to be a refresher because these are just simple EMT skills for some of us, but for some it's going to be a little bit more advanced skills. Um, got some other subject matter experts, uh, we'll come up here, we're going to talk about different types of tourniquets, we're going to talk about how to seal up different types of wounds and different types of options, especially in a mass casualty setting where the traditional uh, tourniquets as we know them, you're just not simply not going to have enough to make a difference right away. Um, outside in the base we have I think a dozen different scenario stations set up so you guys will be able to go out there and see if you can actually stop the bleed uh, we'll have people out we got wounds out there that are uh, IEDs blown off their legs and arms we've got gunshot wounds to the chest uh, different types of bleeds and fractures and so we're gonna put some of this to the test so this gloves on the back table and uh, you guys will be able to take advantage of that so for the first part of the evening I'm gonna turn it over to Martha Hill She's the EMS coordinator. If you got a problem with sign, I go find her. How's that? All right. Do we have a chance to sign in before we get going? Nope. If you have it, please add your MIMS number and I can give us MIMS CEU also. So very important that you sign in if you also want to become a Stop the Bleed instructor because this course is required for that and the certificate you get tonight will help you in that path if that's something that you're interested in pursuing. Make sure that your name is legible on there so we can get a certificate to you. So as Scott said, my name is Martha Hill. I'm a nurse at Sinai. I've also been involved in EMS since the mid-90s as well. Um, tonight he asked me to come so we could present the Stop the Bleed, Bleed curriculum. So this curriculum curriculum is actually meant for the public. This product came about from a, um, a group of senior officials in the White House, the National Security Council, that came together and decided we needed a standardized curriculum across the United States to teach basics and bleeding control for the public. So several groups got together. The most notable is the Hartford Consensus. This was a panel of experts that met over a few years and they've put out several consensus papers that talk about the foundation of this whole program, why this is needed in the nation, who is, who is the target audience for this, what skills should we be teaching, why are we teaching these, where is the evidence that says we should be teaching what we're teaching. And it really goes back to looking at the evidence that they've been amassing over the last decade and a half in Iraq and Afghanistan and the injuries that were seen there and what the survivability is and what the survival rate rates were with different injuries and they've decided and they've shown that a lot of preventable deaths could have or a lot of deaths could have been prevented if the basics had been done first. So this is really where this comes from. Then they take that evidence that they've gathered in the wartime and they're making it applicable to civilians. So for use in active shooter mass casualty situations. But not only that, for use in basic household or industrial emergencies as well. 
down there in the lower left corner is the one that puts out the scientific evidence. So if you're looking for the evidence to back this program, you'll find it there. The other groups as well also contributed many members to that panel as well. Can you adjust those so we can Okay, so like I said, this is geared toward the, toward the lay person and toward the public, and that's how I'm going to present it, because I want you to see how the program is rolled out to the public, so you can explain to the public what the program is if you want to teach the program to the public. These are the slides you'll use, and this is the information that you're going to deliver. So talking to the public, it's important to lay out why this is important, because it's not automatically intuitive to them why they would need a class and stop the bleeding, other than the sensationalism of the active shooters and the different scenarios that we've seen recently, it's not, they don't think about that this could be used in other situations. This can be used at home, this can be used at the job, in the workplace. I'm using the right, right click, it's just not advancing. It's going to do that for everyone. Okay, so there's a... There's a couple objectives with the program. The first one is to recognize what is life-threatening bleeding. Again, not intuitive to the public. How much blood is severe bleeding? Is it a few tablespoons, a few teaspoons? What is severe bleeding? What is, what is life-threatening bleeding compared to non-life-threatening bleeding? And then we're gonna talk about three different ways that we would teach the public to stop bleeding. So as always, here's your warning. Some of the pictures are graphic. We have to show graphic pictures. If we're going to show you bleeding, um, we have to show you how to stop it. If you feel sick or dizzy, feel free to step outside, get some air. So this is why we present why we need these. Not only for that sensationalist active shooter, work-related injuries, motor vehicle crashes, home injuries. So like we learn in EMT class or the basic fundamental, the first thing we have to talk to the public about is making sure that they're ensuring their own safety before they rush in to help. So people who are good natured, goodwill, want to jump in, they want to help, they get that tunnel vision, they see the wound, they see the blood, they want to jump in and help. They don't stop to think about their own safety. So reminding them that they have to look at the scene, make sure that they're not going to become a victim as well, and reminding them that whatever caused that injury to that person might still be there, might still be a threat to themselves. And we'll see that on some slides later on. We're also going to cover the ABCs of bleeding with them, reminding them to call 911, reminding them how 911 works and how it doesn't work and, and what are some of the nuances with that. Talking about finding the bleeding, so for them that means actually exposing the wound you can't treat what you can't see so teaching them not to be afraid to open up and and find where that bleeding is coming from and then we'll talk in depth about these three things about stopping the bleeding we're going to talk about how to use a tourniquet we're going to talk about how to use direct pressure and we're going to talk about how to pack wounds so some of you who have been in EMS for a long period of time probably knew that what's old is what's new again probably 20 years ago, tourniquets were all the rave and we could pack wounds and then we were told no, never use a tourniquet, never put anything in a wound, and now it's new again, right? Well, we have lots of evidence over the last decade that says this is probably a good thing and the right thing to do. So again, reminding the public about their safety. Also talking to them about bloodborne infections is important, right? They may or may not have gloves with them, what they should do if they don't have gloves, what they do if they're going to intervene anyway, or they've been exposed. Important to remind them to talk to the providers who do come on scene to let them know they've been exposed, teaching them to wash their hands afterwards, use gloves if they have them. 911, it's important when you talk about 911 to the public, to, everybody has their cell phone and they're gonna call on their cell phone. Well, that doesn't automatically give the dispatcher the location where you are. It can take some time to have to triangulate or figure out where a call is coming from, even with the enhanced 911 systems that we have. So important to tell them to put that on speaker, keep the people on the phone, let them know the address while they do intervene. And also to get that 911 call off first, because if you you are actively involved in 
stopping bleeding. Your hands are going to be busy and you're not going to be able to stop doing what you're doing or let up pressure to then make that call. So make that call first and put it on speakerphone. And this is the biggest thing that the public probably needs to know about bleeding is understanding what constitutes life-threatening bleeding. So what are some things that make bleeding life-threatening as opposed to not life-threatening? Throw out some things. Your mouth. Right, so what's a, what's a good amount for can you relate to the public that would make that relatable? Like how much? Like a gallon of milk, half a gallon of milk. Yeah, that's a pretty severe amount yeah. of blood. But how about how about like a Coke can or a soda can or something? Maybe a half a soda can starts to put you into a severe bleeding emergency or life-threatening emergency, and they've lost a gallon of blood. They're probably. Yeah. well on that journey huh but trying to make it relatable to them something that they see every day an amount that they could you know easily think about what are some other things that make it severe or life-threatening bleeding as opposed to okay so, so what's the difference what's it look like when it comes from an artery versus okay what else how does it present Is it, Okay, so splurting blood versus the soaking blood. What else do we see with heavy bleeding? What else can we see in there as it starts to progress on? We see, we see clots, right? Telling them not to disturb those clots, to leave those clots in there when they're taking action. What about as we start to progress and we start to go into, some, into shock? What happens to the mental status? Right, so that's some other key indicators that we can talk to the public about when people start to change their mental status. So here's two examples of what, what life-threatening wounds or life-threatening bleeding injuries would look like. This is to point out the difference between like a spurting type injury, like you said, from the artery, or a venous type injury where you have that long, steady soak. Both life-threatening bleeding, but look very different. So when we talk about bleeding, there's three areas that we're concerned about. And we're concerned about the limbs. We're also concerned about the junctions, which we'll see a little bit later on. That's where the limb meets the body or meets the core. And then we'll talk about um, the core itself. So with arm and leg wounds, these are the most frequent and preventable causes of death. Why is that? Why do you think the literature came back and says these are the most frequent causes of death? We're using literature from Afghanistan and Iraq. Right. That is one reason. Oh. What's, oops, what's protected there in the middle? What are people usually wearing? Bands. Yeah, they're usually wearing some type of body armor, right, that protects their core. So of course a lot of the military literature is gonna come back and say there are a lot of arm and leg wounds that cause preventable death because for the most part they're protected in their chest and their head. And they might have some neck and some junctional armpit wounds, but for the most part they have protection there. So a lot of their injuries do look like this. Um, is that always true for civilian injuries? Civilians don't walk around body armor, right? So we may see a higher rate of injury to the, to the core or to the torso. So we'll also talk about how to, how to deal with the, that type of bleeding as well. So this type of bleeding responds to what? How can we fix this type of bleeding? Tourniquet, what else? Simpler before tourniquet, what do we do first? Direct pressure, so that's always what we're gonna start with. Always start with direct pressure. We can't control with direct pressure, we're gonna move on to the tourniquet. And that's usually what will stop the bleeding for arm and leg wounds. So the junctions are a little bit different, right? These types of injuries, do you think we see these as much in the civilian as the military does? No, these are usually caused by blasts or arms or small arms or some kind of direct fire. 
right? This is your armpit, your neck, your groin. These are difficult to control. These take a lot of pressure and a lot of packing. And when I mean packing, I mean a lot of packing. You could dump all of the supplies on your ambulance and may not be able to pack enough to get into these spaces. The direct pressure that we're talking about here is a knee, is an elbow. It's not, it's not an easy hand pressure. These wounds are hard to pack. They can bleed a lot. There's a lot of space in there. All right. In the box, what do we normally see? What kind of wounds are in the center, in the mass? What do we see in the civilian world? Gunshots, what else? Knives, stabbings, yeah. Can we do a whole lot about these injuries? No. We're gonna seal the box. So we're gonna seal these wounds, mostly. Um, we don't get into that too much with the public training. They reserve that more so for the EMT level training and higher. They really don't talk a whole lot about sealing the wounds. I think we should talk more with the public about that. If they're able to, if they have something available, we should be teaching them how to seal these wounds. But um, what these people need is just rapid transport. These people need a surgeon, a trauma surgeon. So just to review the algorithm for the public, we're always going to talk about safety. It's a thing we always talk about EMT class first, scene safety. Look for signs of life-threatening bleeding. Tell them don't be afraid to open the clothes, expose the area. Don't be afraid about issues with modesty. You have to see what you're dealing with there. And then we'll go down the path. Do they have the supplies available? If nothing is available to them, what do we say? Use what you got, right? That's a t-shirt, try to use something clean. You can use the patient's t-shirt. You can use something that you can find. They're at home, use what you got. Try to start off with direct pressure. Everything. Yeah, rip, rip parts of t-shirts, towels, whatever you have there. So direct pressure is always gonna be the first step. Use your hands if possible. If you need an elbow in there, if you need a knee in there, do what you have to do to get the pressure on there. Once you put pressure on the wound, you cannot let pressure go. You need to keep it on there. No peeking and checking to see if it's still bleeding. That's not gonna work. You gotta keep it on there and it has to be firm pressure. And with your, um, with your students, you're gonna practice that firm pressure. You want to see how hard it is really to get that bleeding to stop. So we have some props that you're gonna see how much pressure really is needed to get some of this bleeding to stop. Okay, and with this one, it's also talking about not only are we going to use that for pressure, but if you don't have anything else available, you can use that clean cloth or you can use whatever cloth you have available to pack that wound. And you're going to remind them that packing the wound and providing pressure on that wound is extremely painful. Sometimes it hurts more than the wound itself for the patient. So let them know that what you're doing is attempting to stop the bleeding and save their lives because they're going to be crying out in pain and they're going to think that you're hurting them rather Rather than helping them. All right, so going down that same algorithm for the public, always ensuring they're seeing safety, exposing, looking for that bleeding. Now we do have equipment available. You're going to ask, where is it? Which, which equipment are you going to need? Do you have a tourniquet? All right, if you have a tourniquet, where are you going to go? Always above. So Stop the Bleed talks about putting this current tourniquet two to three inches above the wound. I can tell you that most practitioners and most experienced practitioners go high. They go very high. You want to go across the single bone. You don't want to go across the double bones and the lower limbs, and you definitely don't want to go across the joint. In those areas, you may not get the bleeding to stop there. So you want to go high, and you want to go tight. See how high they are here? I mean, the wound's high, but this is pretty much how high you want to go to get that bleeding to stop. Like I said, this curriculum always stresses two to three inches above, but you can go higher than that. What we do stress to them is do not put it over the joints, no elbows, no knees. If you're gonna put it over um, anything that has a pocket in it or any kind of, of thick, bulky sleeves, you're gonna have to see if that's gonna work, because likely that's gonna keep your tourniquet from working. 
All right, so look on your desk. There's several types of tourniquets spread throughout the room. Take a look at these and then pass them around and make sure you all get to see. There's so many different types of tourniquets out there on the market. Some are better than others. Let me show this one. This is generally the um, most accepted tourniquet. This is a cat tourniquet. This is what law enforcement, military officers will use. The benefit of this type of tourniquet is that it's, you can put it on by yourself with one hand. So if you're wounded, you could put this on yourself with only, your, with only one hand. Velcro. You guys are going to do this. Yep, we're going to go. To practice. You guys are going to put tourniquets on tonight. You're going to stop your own pulses. It's going to hurt. You're going to whine. Don't <laughs> care. But you guys are going to learn how to put tourniquets on. You really put tourniquets on. Who's got the tourniquet that has like the blow up, the balloon in it, and the dial? Uh, I think Who's got? Behind you. Did you take this that one? Uh, yeah. yeah. So these types of tourniquets are out there as well. These are don't always work so well because they have a release button on the side and they get bumped and they get released and also some of them have balloons in them that actually can deflate or lose their lose their pressure over time. Any other, all oh, the soft tourniquets. So this is another type of tourniquet that's out there. These are much cheaper. These are 10, 11 bucks compared to 30 bucks for the cat tourniquet. These will show you they have pictures on them and as you stretch them, the pictures distort so you will know when there's enough stretch or enough pressure on there. These work just as well. The downside to these is that you need two hands generally to use them and they get slippery when they're wet and slimy with blood. But we'll go over all of them and we'll practice using all of them in the, in the scenarios. So the pieces and parts of the cat tourniquet, you're going to have the Velcro strap that he showed you. You're going to go all the way around with it. It's got a buckle on it. It has a clip where you can clip the windlass, which is the rod that you will turn. And then you'll put a piece of Velcro over top to secure that. So as Scott showed you, it's going to go around the arm. You're going to pull that Velcro. This is the most important part. If you don't get this part right, the rest of it doesn't matter. You have got to pull it very tight, very tight, as tight as you can get it. You should only be turning that windlass once or twice. If you find yourself turning it three, four, five times, it's because you haven't done this step correctly. You have to pull it very, very tight and make sure there's nothing under there. Get all the slack out at this point. Take your time here putting it on. Don't cover up that Velcro. You're going to have to stick your windlass in there. Get your windlass in there and then you can cover it with the Velcro. The piece that goes over top, you can write your time on there. Most EMS providers will write it very visibly. They'll use a Sharpie. You can put it on the arm. You can put it on the forehead. You can put it on here. It's a little bit harder to see. You don't have flash tire on there. To play the video. Okay. <laughs> you all right? Okay. So what's old is what's new. We were always worried before that tourniquets would always lead to amputation, right? Everybody that got a tourniquet was going to lose that limb, and the science shows that that's not true. Most people who have a tourniquet on for less than two hours don't really have any residual effect from the tourniquet itself. But the goal is still to get someone to the trauma center as fast as you can and get that tourniquet off and get definitive care for that person. When you're um, doing your training tourniquets, you don't want to leave them on to the point that your arm turns blue. You want, you want to experience it. You want to see what it feels like, but to each other. Um, when you teach the class as well, you want to stress that with your, with your um, folks that you don't want to hurt, let them hurt each other. But you do want them to see how tourniquets feel. They do hurt. So here's our big mistakes that we see, especially when you're teaching the lay person. Don't wait to put the tourniquet on. There's always that, uh, do I do it? Do I not do it? Is it severe enough? I don't know. I don't have the experience. Do it. Put it on. Get the bleeding to stop. Um, they need to know they can use a second tourniquet. If the first one doesn't work, they can put another tourniquet right above it. 
and that should get the bleeding to stop if the first tourniquet did not work. And we always teach them never, 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 never take it off. Let the hospital take it off. Even here they say only a paramedic can, or a doc can loosen it. Uh, not even a paramedic in the field. You should, there's no need to take it off once you put it on unless you're the, the doc or the surgeon that's going to fix the injury. All right, we're going to skip the practice because we're going to do it all together. All right, so moving down our algorithm some more. No tourniquet available. Again, we're going to go with the gauze. If you have clean, dry, sterile hemostatic gauze, that's great. If you have gauze that doesn't have any hemostatic properties to it, it doesn't have any anything in it to help promote clot, that's fine. Use that. If you don't have either one of those, clean, dry material will work. And direct pressure if they don't have a tourniquet available to them. So many types of hemostatic dressings out there. If you look on your desk, I think there's a, there are several different kinds out there. We have Israeli bandages, which have some hooks in them. You want me to send these around, Scott? Did you put any out on the tables? So the, we'll practice using these. These wrap around and have clips in them where you can secure the bandages. We have rolled gauze, compressed gauze, Z-folded gauze, all kinds of gauze products out there to help stop the bleeding. We also have products that are embedded with stuff, so they go by a bunch of different trade names. Quick Clot, we have Felox. Down there you can see Kytoflex, Kytogauze. They all have slightly different chemical agents in them that promotes clotting. Some of them require your body to have an intact clotting system to actually work, and some don't. Um, so. Some people prefer one to the other, but different organizations use different ones. The military generally goes with the quick clot, but World Health chooses the sea locks. Do you know if they're all radio okay? I, I mean, the one on the so, left doesn't look like it would be. Yeah, the newer ones are. No. The newer ones have the blue stripes okay. and are all radio so opaque, but the older ones, true. not necessarily true. Uh, there's several different generations, right? So the first one's the problem where some of the chemical agents heated up and caused burns. Yeah. Some of them, they had a hard time removing the agent from the body. So they've, they've gotten better with each generation. And the newest generation has the blue stripes on them, so they're radio opaque and don't get left behind. Okay. Wound packing is the second skill and the other second skill station that we're going to go over. We're going to have um, several instances of wound packing out here. But basically, you're going to expose the wound. You're going to use a gloved hand, go in the wound. You're going to feel for the wound bed, trying to, to see how big the wound extends under the skin. Sometimes what you see on the outside is definitely not what you see on the inside, right? You start to get some fingers down in there, and you can feel that wound tunnels. That wound goes places. It's much bigger, larger. There's a lot of cavitation inside. So put your hand in there and feel what you've got. And you need to pack, and you need to pack a lot. And if you're still bleeding through, even when you feel like you've got it packed, continue to put fresh stuff in there, fresh gauze over there. Don't take out what's already in there, just add to. So here's a good example that shows you just the difference between packing and not packing and how you leave that open cavitation that just leaves an area for the bleeding to continue to occur. That was a wound packing video, but we'll get plenty of experience with it out there. There we go. All right, so some people say the tourniquets don't work on children or are too big for children. Those um, cat tourniquets go pretty small. I mean, you can get a child a child to stop bleeding with the cat tourniquets. Um, some people carry these for exactly that reason that they say you know the other ones may not fit obese or pediatric patients. It's good to have a variety. These will definitely fit an obese or pediatric patient. Um, some people try to put two of the cat tourniquets together to make them larger. That always I don't find that works so well, do you? They kind of, they slide and they slip and it, it just doesn't work. Can you scroll me down? Oh, it's, 
That's thinking. Okay. All right, so well, that's the third skill station. So besides the um, pressure, the tourniquet, and the packing, that's generally what you're going to present to the public, and that's generally what we're going to practice tonight. And um, after this class, you'll get a certificate for sitting through this you know, training for the lay person. If you're interested in becoming an instructor, there's criteria on the website about how you become an instructor. The certificate is part of what you'll need for that. Pick up from here and we're going to go over higher level of care for these wounds. We're going to talk about EMT level and above and we're going to get into some of the hands-on with the different products. So with the instructors, feel free to take any of these skills and build them into any of your classes. All right, so basic bleeding and bandaging. What's our first level of care? We get to the scene, we have somebody that's got a pretty nasty cut. What are we doing for them? What's our first level of treatment? Pressure dressing. So they got a wound. They, if it's a really nasty bleed, one of our people put our hand over. But if not, put, get some four by four. So everybody find a partner. On each of your tables should be a couple of uh, gauze pads and a roll of cling. You guys are going to need those. first thing we're going to worry about is go ahead and get your couple of four by fours out lay it on your partner's arm so pretend they got a wound on there when you guys go to assess the wound first thing you're going to be looking at is what kind of blood's coming out is it a steady flow of blood like a capillary is it a dark venous bleed coming out or is it squirting blood in your face because it's an arterial bleed that'll tell you the level of what you want to do if it's an arterial bleed am i playing with this? Yeah. No. Putting a hand on there and going right to a tourniquet. But most of this, this should stop 99% of the bleeding you guys need to deal with. So, take your roller gauze, start down below the wound, a couple of nice good wraps, and stop when you get to the top of the 4x4. Four four. <laughs> Try to keep it rolled together. Make it tight. This is a pressure dressing. Designed to put pressure on. So put a little pressure. <laughs> Once you get to the top of the wound, because we're wrapping distal to proximal, right? From the wrist all the way up into the body. Once you put that first wrap on, it'll become very obvious how bad this thing is bleeding. If this reasonably controls the bleeding, all you need to do is just finish it off with the same level of tightness that you're doing now. But if it turns red, you guys are going to want to escalate very quickly to a pressure dressing. Only thing you have to do at that point, as you're wrapping it, is as you come around the wound, you're going to twist and pull it as you come around and twist and pull and twist and pull three or four good times. This should hurt. Not tourniquet level, but you're getting close. If this thing bleeds through, you're pulling the skin together and securing it together. Make this thing hurt. Your partner should complain about this. You guys put these on. BK and I are going to walk around and check them. This is designed to be a pressure dressing. Make it with pressure. Squeeze. Go ahead. Take it easy on this guy. But come on, put it on. Make it hurt. You guys not have clean? We should have said something. Bring you clean. We got plenty. No, because you can't do a pressure dressing with uh, with that. You definitely got to have clean because that's not going to let you stretch. are unwrapping you'll find it's easier if the, if the gauze is unrolling from the top and wrapping around the wound you'll find it'll pull a lot tighter so each, both you and your partner need to do this so everybody take a second and do a pressure dressing you can still get tighter than that you can do not feel bad though I mean, I'll see his hand. So basically, I want it all in one spot. So I basically would cut up the wound and twist and pull and so twist and pull. The, so don't just end at the top. Go well, I, I go, I'll put like three or four good ones in and then wrap this the rest of the way around. Right. Can you move your fingers? Okay. A little, little tingly, though. Okay. Give him one of the band 
70 people exactly. <laughs> Anybody having an issue with the pressure dressing? I'm now going to go over a, a couple different things with BK. We have several different toys laying around the room for you guys to play with. So we're going to do two or three at a time and then let you guys go around and practice with different ones. So the other compression bandage that some of you guys may have easily available is called an Israeli bandage. So they come in two different sizes, four inch and six inch. Obviously it was designed by people like him, the Israelis. Wrap it around the wound. This has a nice thick pressure ga uh, gauze pad in here designed to absorb lots of blood. This is designed to go directly over the wound. Apply it directly over the wound. Guys, you're going to offset it a little bit because you're going to pull that lever backwards in a second and you want that lever being on top of the wound itself. Put it in here, secure it. And as BK said, it works off of back pressure. So as I bring this around, I'm pulling it nice and snug and secure. And each time you put a nice good pull on that, It's a cloth. It's, it's like an elastic, yeah. There's a small little hook here at the end. Take it, hook it in, and we're done. Is it designed to be a tourniquet? No. But it should be a nice heavy pressure dressing, and your patient should, should legitimately still have a pulse, assuming they have a hand down here. Um, so that's one type of uh, product that we have. Another point of them, just so you guys know, most people are not aware of it, they have a sleeve at the end of it for self-application. Yeah, hey, well, so go right, good. But if you need to put it on yourself, sorry, did I uh, No, no, that was my next thing, but you're good. I'm sorry. So you can put it on yourself if you needed to. Okay, so that's what that thing is there for. If we go back to the Boston bombing, what saved most of those people were the police officers and their IFACs, the individual first aid kits. It was a series of tourniquets and pressure dressings that they were able to get on, the, on all the extremity wounds relatively quickly. Same thing in Las Vegas. Um, we have some MCI drills coming up, one's on June 10th, we can use some role players and providers because uh, we'll build on these types of skills but in a very uh, uh, mass casualty setting. So we talked about the cat tourniquet, there's a variation that uh, we keep here, in the, that we're using here in the county called a soft T. The only difference is, we'll find one in the neighborhood, the difference is how you secure it at the end instead of there being a little catch like you have on the cat tourniquet. It, it actually has a couple of different triangles that you need to uh, get to apply. So instead of a U shape, there's a triangle shape. It works the same exact manner. Sorry, I'm on the elbow. Yep. Works the same exact manner, only at the end of it, you have to be a little more dexterity oriented and get it into a little triangle. See. The other advantage of this one is that this is still enough plastic. So there have been cases of the cat uh, windless breaking, this will not break. You can do it yourself? Uh, it's a little You harder. can, but it's very difficult. The cat's much easier to self-apply. Trying to, uh, under a panicking situation, because I'm not happy with all that blood coming out of my body, for me to find that's going to be a little more difficult. The third tourniquet we have out there that Martha mentioned was called a soft tee. So this one, I'm sorry, sorry, SWAT T, S W A T, so stretch, wrap, and tuck. So we found with playing with this that adding a little tail to the end makes it a lot easier. We're practicing on the lower arms just because, but legitimately, when you guys go to put a tourniquet on, you need to look at the type of wound. So if BK had a nasty cut and he cut all the way down to the bone, everything in his arm is stretched pretty tight now, correct? Muscles, tendons, ligaments, all that stuff, right? So what happens when we cut it? 
it all snaps like a rubber band and where does it go? Uh, Potentially up into his upper arm. So when we say high and tight, that's where that premise comes from. So if I'm going to go with the high and tight, we'll put this up here. The tourniquet has to go at least two inches above the wound. But again, high and tight's not going to hurt. Leave a little tail here at the end. So as you bring this around, and for those that have it, you'll see that there's different shapes on here. And every time you bring it around, you want to make sure that you're changing shape on it. When done properly, and again, if this thing was full of blood, it might get a little slippery, so you definitely got to take your time and make sure you're pulling proper tension on this. No. No, he's just a bobby. Big enough, so. Why? <laughs> Can you move your fingers? Yeah, for now. <laughs> and so then I could take the tail at the end and just tuck it in and tie it off. But the hardest part is always to tuck the, uh, the end of it, so by leaving the little tail, you just make a knot a lot easier to secure it. Oh, that's got to be yeah, a tourniquet. Yeah. <laughs> Good job there. And look, guys, I want you to put them on for real. Don't leave them on for long. But the, the thing I want you to experience by doing this is you guys need to recognize the pain you're putting your patient under. These tourniquets are going to be a lot more painful than the wound itself. And I need you to ignore that. There is nothing that you could do in the field to replace their blood. Yeah, you guys can drop some fluids into them, but it's just fluid. It's just taking up space. It's not replacing what the blood actually does for the body. So, can I have one more note? Just one more note, specifically if you're using the cats and if you're dealing with an amputation, we always thought to go over the link. You will not be able to go over a link if you partially attach your front foot. Today is actually taking it apart and running it through um, after it's around the lane where you want to secure it. Um, just because most people understand how the issues of doing this little movement, right? So get used to it. Last tourniquet that we're going to let you guys practice, then we're going to go into seals and packing. So the last tourniquet, which is what most of you guys learned in EMT school, is we only have a couple of these. There are supervisors that have the tourniquet, the vest and the tourniquets in Baltimore County now. Uh, Chestnut Ridge uh, has a truck that has a bunch of vests. Some medic units are have the vest with the tourniquets on there. So when you guys see those, those are nothing more than vests to carry lots of equipment around and especially stuff like this. So when you run out of commercial grade tourniquets, all you need to grab is some sort of a windlass. So stick is fine and all you need is a simple uh, triangular bandage. When you pull a triangle your bandage out it comes out on the perfect uh, uh, length and width so you don't need to do anything when I go to put this on here I need to somehow make some sort of a compression against his arm so I could take a roll of gauze to do that so now I'm going to take it and on the outside of his arm I'm going to tie a single overhand knot and a second one goes through to make what's called a surgeon's knot reasonably tight put another surgeon's knot right over top of it Whatever you make for a windlass, take and stick and insert it between the two. Now you can go ahead and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and keep twisting until the pulse goes away or the bleeding stops. Now you got to secure this in place. So you want to wrap this around one direction, wrap this around in the opposite direction, and then tie it off underneath of his arm. That way it does not unravel. And for all the hose beaters, we'll put an overhand safety knot so you guys feel better. And now it's secured in place. We still got to note the time of the tourniquet. So ideally, you have a Sharpie piece of tape on his forehead. Um, the old blood on the forehead, yeah, we talk about it. It's definitely not one of the sanitary things to do. But we do need to note the time. The surgeons do need to know when that was applied so they know how long they have to work with this. I understand that in, uh, in the combat zones, we had soldiers being evacuated to Germany. And they've been with tourniquets on force. 16, 18 hours at a time. So and they kept their arm up. They kept their arm. So, yeah, you want to put the time on if possible, but if you have a mass casualty incident and you have a lot of patients, so don't freak over it. If you do not have a sharp here, you do not put the time. Just keep going. Just put the tourniquets on. Don't let it stop you. All right, now you guys should have variations of different things on different tables. Plan is for you guys to practice with something and pass them around. So you guys use the cat tourniquets, the triangular, and the uh, Israeli bandages, and the soft tee, the SWAT tees, and make your own. So let's take about 15 minutes to let you guys play with these. That was to apply direct pressure over the artery. So I put it on the inside. Well, we got to do it before. 
Yeah, you need fingernails to get it started. But you can pull the center of it out gently and pack the wound. We're going to pass this around. It's called the X-Stats. This was something the military just released. You want to pop one of these and do your thing? Um, I can, well, I don't have water here. But essentially, you'll see all the pellets inside the pellets when they come in contact with fluid, such as blood. They expand. It's like a tampon. Um, sorry, I don't need that. I should do. I do. The video. You just want me to say tampon to the video? Yes. Yeah. All right. So once you shove it into a wound, essentially internally so as these pellets go in and they expand in size uh, they, they increase the pressure and thus uh, essentially instead of putting a tourniquet from the outside this is pressure from the inside out they also are impregnated with quick clot not that that's a mechanism to work under but it does have it would you put that in through and through wound? Or would it, I mean, it would just expand all the way? I mean, when you squirt it in, does it come out the other end? It won't come out the other end. It won't come out. Yeah. No, a, gunshot, a gunshot doesn't work that way. No, I'm saying that the stuff will. No, the pellets, the pellets won't either. Yeah. No, they just put, they push out one at a time. Okay. Um, and if you guys look at the pellets when they come around, you'll see that little blue indicator on there. That's a marker so they can run through an x-ray and make sure that none of these are left inside. So these were just released for civilian use. They're about, what, 400 bucks a uh, device? The bigger one is about 250 the small one is 90 or a pack of three for 240. Oh, so they came down to price yeah, significantly. Price okay. Um, now let's talk about specifically some other wounds. So tell me about head wounds. What are our considerations if your patient has a head wound? So one is a lot of blood vessels in the face, a reasonably small cut on his face is going to run down his face, down his shirt, it's going to look really bad. A lot worse than it actually is, correct? So don't be afraid to just come up here, wipe the face down. Ooh, still looks like that, okay. Um, but wipe the face down, realize it's just a small cut. I can put my gauze here, wrap it around his head, no problem. Now what about a neck wound? We talk about wanting to put a compression bandage on there, but if I wrap something around his neck, actually, nobody would complain. Yeah. But oh. in theory, so, but what would happen if I wrapped it around his neck and started pulling a pressure dressing? We're going to cut off pressure on both sides. So if I have a hole in his body from his waist up to his neck, what is my other concern? Besides stopping the bleeding coming out, air going into the body. So that's my secondary concern. So what type of a dressing do we use on a wound like this called an occlusive dressing so the principle of an occlusive dressing is to stop the air as well so you've got multiple options on the ambulance and in general to try to use a simple piece of plastic would be sufficient if you have nothing else there are commercially made seals chest seals halo and hyphen, um, hyphen and there's a third one so there's a bunch of different ones out there and these are either self venting where a vent is built into there so you really can't build up a, uh, a pressure and some of these are just going to seal on all four sides something else you guys have in your ambulance that you can make quick use of are AED pads while it is not the most ideal thing to use it is got a bunch of glue and it is going to adhere and it's four by four so that's a pretty good size four inches by four inches and if you wipe the chest down and slap that right on there now the adhesive will be able to kind of help work with you and hold that in place so again and you also have the packaging that you can use itself uh, for an occlusive dressing so all of these will work you also have when you start your IVs now your little tegaderms those will also so I've used these on several small gunshot wounds and do we care about entrance versus exit when we're talking about gunshot wounds could care less hole one hole two hole three just count them as you go through because even if you are a ballistics expert it really doesn't matter in our world we just got to find the holes and plug them up right and Martha mentioned about finding the blades so if you deal with one gunshot wound look for the second one because likelihood there's an exit wound somewhere and it's not always parallel to the entry one. Why is that? Don't forget to look at yeah. the armpits. Raise those armpits up and look at the groins and crevices. We miss gunshot wounds even in the ED that are in the recesses and cracks. And one of the things I cannot overemphasize is cleaning up the area that you need to work in. So if he's got a neck wound, it's a big bloody mess. Is anything I'm going to do really going to stick to his body? Am I going to be able to tape this and hold it? No. So I'm not even thinking about anything taping. So this probably is going to be off the table. So if he's got a nasty wound, I'm going to wipe it down. 
partner's going to hold the occlusive dressing over there. I'm going to put some 4x4s here, only just absorb what's coming out. My partner's putting a pretty good seal on there. So now I'm going to come around and I'm going to put a couple wraps, and there's no pressure on this. This is just to really hold everything in place. Then, wounds on this side, I'm going to get him to raise his other arm, and I'm going to come around. Maybe Instructor Ritz can come up here and show the figure eight, but uh, I'm going to go with the straight wrap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was you I was calling out. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know the figure eight, so we just go with the straight wrap. Now, if we just go ahead and tie this off in here. All right, PK, go ahead and put your hand, hand down. Do you feel the pulling pressure on the one side? All right, so now you can control the neck bleed. And then we just secure his arm, make sure they put our secure his arm over there. I would probably tie something around here just to make sure we're holding good pressure, and that's going to work for a neck wound. Um, uh, sir? Do you need to check for a pulse? Do not check for a carotid pulse on the opposite side, right? Otherwise, you've got to pressure. Good call. <laughs> Does he have to have a reasonable LOC for himself bandage under his arm? No, I'll, I'll do it myself if I have to. And that's why I said that. And then, and then I would definitely have to secure his arm to his body to make sure I maintain that pressure if he's not able to help me. Because I would assume that he's going to be unable to because of the type of wound. I thought that was the benefit. If they're reasonably conscious, they can control their son. Absolutely they can, but if not, I'm still going to use the same dressing because it's really all I have. Okay. Um, Sucking chest wound, when you guys find it in the field, first thing one of you needs to do is put a gloved hand over there. Then again, we're going to wipe it down depending upon the size. We'll either grab a pre-made package. You guys can grab any, um, if you grab a trauma pad, the inside of your trauma pad, that's a pretty good sized piece of plastic. It only needs to be two inches bigger than the wound. Um, again, with a wound like this, you're going to have to be doing constant wiping to try to get some tape to seal. And when you make your tape, it's going to be all the way across the chest so I can find dry areas to actually get this to adhere to. I would still have somebody holding pressure once that seals in place and even with the tape there, it's bloody so it's not going to stick real well. We want somebody to continue holding pressure over there. What happens, so I've sealed this wound, we're going to keep doing our dense bleed sweep because as he said, if it came through here, it might have gone through his back, it might have gone through his leg, so we need to go head to toe and really checking for all the potential exit wounds. Once we package all these wounds up, what's the risk of us sealing up this hole in his chest? Tension. So attention pneumothorax. So what's, what, how's your patient going to present? So initially they were probably, so if they had a hole in their chest, are we going to have tracheal shift potentially? Okay. Um, so it's a later sign, so depending on where you, where you have it. Um, and it's going to be in the direction of the good line, right? So if you have pressure building on the right, so pressure is going to push that trachea in that direction. So you're going to bag your patient, maintain the airway suction, we're going to seal it. At some point, as you guys are bagging, there's still a hole in their lungs, potentially, right? So that air has got to go somewhere. So the air ends up in their chest, and then we end up putting more pressure in there, and then what do we have to do to this particular dressing? What we call burping it, so peeling a corner, hearing the uh, air escape. Now, once ALS gets on the scene, paramedics, what's your option? This is just going to hurt a little bit, sir. Okay. <laughs> so, carry these on the ambulance. They're going to put a couple of these in here. The problem is they're probably going to clog up pretty quickly with blood clots, so you're probably going to see them putting a series of these things in. Um, so, once those are in, that should reduce the likelihood that we're going to have to uh, do this ourselves, but we still need to manage it. We do need to pay attention because that still may be a Matthew, you got a question? So over time, hasn't the, the needle decompression cycle been changing? Yeah. Um, the military is doing different things than the paramedics. So the secondary is becoming the primary now. So instead of going on the clavicular line, they're going, yeah, the mid oxillary line. But honestly, it's an ALS skill, so it's nothing. Most of us are not going to deal with it in the field. But just recognize when they get there, that's going to be one of the critical things that they're going to end up doing. Um, evisceration. So if he has part of his guts hanging out, obviously if they're out, out, we need to kind of pick them up and put them back where they belong, not stuffing it like a turkey. Don't re-impact those. Just kind of hang them up on top. But how do we do that? How do we manage that type of a wound? So what goes directly over his guts? A lightly moist dressing. So a trauma pad would be awesome. Again, two inches bigger than the wound. What goes over the trauma pads? An occlusive dressing. So you may be having to put two or three of these pieces of plastic together from your trauma pads to make a big enough uh, wound around here, or a big enough uh, packing around here. Then how do we 
secure all this in place? Trauma pads. Big trauma pads, put three or four of them up and down his body and use cravats above and below to secure everything in place. The critical part is your partner keeping their hands above and below the injury so that we're not actually putting any pressure directly on the guts themselves. What about using a space blanket? <laughs> so the answer is the space blanket will be used on a, a number of these patients and she's referring to one of these. So we can pass this around for a little bit that's seen one of these. So this is designed to do two things. One, it reflects your body heat back. So as you're suggesting, they're losing an awful lot of blood and we're concerned about things sticking to the wound. So the other thing that's designed for is, that's your burn sheet. So we don't have burn sheets on the units anymore. So any burn that we have, the only thing that should come in contact with it is that Mylar blanket. So again, it's not gonna stick. If, if anybody's never seen somebody going through a debreeding, process for a burn it is pretty painful and it's uh we want to minimize that experience for them so that's all i'm going to be sticking on them so the answer is yes that would work over here but i want to keep those things moist so i'm saying would it hold like make a seal like, no, no no i want that i want to use that to completely cover their body so we're going to wrap them up like a burrito and we're going to let them kind of warm themselves up because that'll reflect the patient's body heat back when their body heat starts dropping their body loses its ability to produce blood clots properly and fix the problem itself so us maintaining heat and oxygen for the patient are two things that we can do at the BLS level to truly help the patient combat shock. What if he's got a nasty femoral bleed? Assume the position, sir. <laughs> so, he's got a nasty femoral bleed. How, and if you guys can't see, oh, you, you might want to see this. <laughs> So how do I help him? I get there right away. I recognize he's got a nasty bleed in his femoral artery. <coughs> so I could stick my finger in there potentially, but that's a little awkward. I'm going to take my knee. That's where you the <laughs> it's a crowd. <laughs> Take my knee. I'm going to drop my knee right here initially. Okay. Turn out pants, whatever it is. Okay. Like, ah, we're good. But your knee dropping right into there and holding it till we can get a tourniquet around. We could take your SWAT or your uh, cat tourniquet and you can unloosen it all the way, wrap it around the limb, and then apply the tourniquet. But think about how difficult that's going to be trying to get it up into that junction to really do that. So quite frankly, you're, you're going to bleed out two, three, four minutes if that's a really nasty wound. So uh, you guys getting in there and putting pressure any way you can would be significant. Right, that high, that tourniquet is not going to be very efficient. <laughs> All right, what we like to do now is we've got several different stations out there. Give, give us about a three-minute head start, a two-minute head start. I'll take the instructors out there, put them on their uh, stations. On the back table are gloves. I encourage you guys to get around to as many of these stations as you can. Get as involved as you want. These things are going to be squirting blood. There will be things that you need to pack wounds. Uh, we'll have eviscerations, sucking chest wounds, burns. <laughs> Yeah, and there's like eight or nine stations out there. So make sure you guys come on through and get some hands-on time. Are there any questions about anything we talked about tonight? I did not. I draw my knee right into his groin because especially in the fire department world, I'm going to be coming off the truck with a pair of pants that are pretty thick and have a pretty good knee. They will absorb all that blood, but I don't care. They'll, I'll get them cleaned. Put, just put your knee right in there and, and, and do what you got to do. I don't have an open cut on my knee, so I'm not horribly concerned about an exposure from the blood, but I got to do what I got. What do you do after you've got the tourniquet on? Take him to the hospital. What are you going to stay on his wound? We're going to determine whether or not that, so as we said, this is a very tough area because I'm right up in here. So to be able to get that thing and pull that tight and actually, and it depends on the wound itself. The wound itself just may not be in a position where I could get that tourniquet. So my putting pressure on there may be all we have. And if that's the case, yep. Or if that's the case, I may even relocate and shove my finger in there and put direct pressure on the artery itself. So BK was just telling me, well tell us what we just talked about with the people not dying from the... Uh, so there was a research that was published in uh, the Journal of Special Operations Medicine a year ago that said that over, I think they uh, surveyed 12 to 13 mass shooting and out of those 170 some fatalities, zero. 
bridge. So all of them died because of gunshot wound to torso or head. Very little we can do about headshots, but torso, anything from my navel to my clavicle, okay, just seal it, just like Martha was saying and just like Scott was saying, right? So be aware of that. We all kind of became very very focused on the tourniquets as the tool to save the world type thing, which was still a great tool, but it's not the only tool. So check what else you have in your toolbox that uh, would work. All right, are there any questions about anything we talked about tonight? So what I want you guys to walk away from tonight is stop the bleeding. No matter where your patient is, no matter what the situation is, you stop the bleeding, like put the fire out, things start to get better pretty quickly for your patient. Um, if you guys are curious about the equipment that we do carry, um, BK's in charge of the um, sword truck up at 50, so a sample of the vest and the equipment that we carry on there is up front, so if you have any questions, uh, he'd be able to answer that. And as would Coast over on the side here. All right, give us a few minutes, form up in teams of four or five, and come on outside and we'll walk, run you guys through the stations, have you out of here by nine o'clock. <laughs>
Direito é tradição, não é que é 